Okay, uh, hello. So uh, I'm finally back to Black and Secret Places. Uh, so this is the Unity project that myself and Jan Sesnik are basically taking turns implementing audio for. Um, where, uh, if I switch to my screen actually, nope, that's not what I wanted to show. Uh, so this Unity project here, and uh, we're implementing the audio using pure data, which looks a bit like this. You're going to see more of this patch today because I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be working on this patch. I think mostly this is what I'm going to be doing today. Um, so uh, to get started, let's just quickly uh, run through the game and just kind of remind ourselves where we're kind of starting off from. things. Um, so one of the things I want to fix is Barbalith, that's this red sphere, is way too quiet at the start now. I'm not quite sure what we've done that's kind of made that happen, um, but I want to fix that. There's also like some weird kind of buffering, thing, buffering things happening with the audio every now and then. Like there, I don't know if you heard that, that wee buzz when I went through that door. I don't know what's going on there. But it feels like something that we should probably fix. Um, I don't also, I think Unity's not picking up my mic, so I'm afraid we, we can't, we're not hearing Jan's cool kind of uh, mic echo stuff. Was uh, the the last door shattering to be kind of uh, a lower pitch than the others? Um, yeah. You get to it. Okay. So I think the last thing I was doing. In fact, let's, let me come away from here just so that I'm not getting drowned out by Barbara. The last thing I was doing was I started adding uh, like points around the sphere, uh, where which modify the barbellous audio. So you get this kind of high pitched kind of ringing here. And I think this is like comb filters, and then like a, a resonant filter, and then I added this kind of glitchy kind of uh, amplitude modulation effect, but I don't think that works really well, so I'll probably take that out and replace it with something different. Yeah, the, 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 the glitchy thing just makes it sound like the, the audio is broken. Um, so yeah, let's, let's get rid of that. It would also be cool if there was like a distinct sound that triggers when we we fall into Barbalith. Um But yes, okay, so um Hi Anne. Um So what do I want to do first? Uh well actually first thing I want to do, um I don't know how noticeable it was, but uh I've got this occlusion code a uh, active on Barbalith. And at the moment, it's active it, throughout the entire scene. But really, I don't think it works anywhere other than... Because I coded it specifically for the, the kind of church scene. 
Um, and particularly once we get here, uh, it kind of doesn't work because the the path of the the spiral just gets in the way, and you kind of hear the barbellous volume like continually dropping, which is not really what I don't think that makes sense. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to modify. I think I'm going to modify my code so that I can turn the occlusion on and off. Um, so here's my my barbellous patch, and I think all I'm going to do is I'm just going to modify the the C sharp code that sends this occlusion value, so that when we're not in the church uh, section, uh, occlusion is just set to zero. So we just kind of ignore any occlusion outside of the, the church scene. So first thing I need is I need my barbellous occlusion script. And I'm going to add a, a variable that we can use to toggle this. Um, Is active a reserved word in Unity? It's just in case. Uh, let's call it occlusion, occlusion active. And we'll have it set to false by default. And yeah. We're only going to do our. Uh, we're only going to run our occlusion code if um, if occlusion active if that flag is actually variable uh, is actually uh, true. So we're just going to ignore all of this code um, whenever occlusion active is false. Um, okay. Okay. Now, the next thing I need to do is I need to turn it. Oh, need to wait for Unity to compile that script. And then I'm going to need to turn, I'm going to toggle that, I'm going to need to toggle that flag when we actually enter this scene or this section. This is uh, this interlude, no, sorry, this is void two. Um, so, uh, Actually, no, I'm looking at these. And I think I'm, I'm going to reorder them in the hierarchy so it actually makes more sense. Because the idea is it goes, oh, no, no, that's not right. OK, I'm not going to touch that. I was thinking that what happens is we go from intro to uh, interlude one to void one, but that's not actually how it works, is it? We go from intro to void, void one to interlude one. Oh. Yeah, I've kind of arranged this in a confusing way. Well, that's my own fault. Uh, so, uh, sorry, what I want to do is interlude one, when we exit interlude one, we enter into uh, void two, which is here, right? Let's double check, I've got this right. Yeah, void two. So I think all I need to do is I just I can just add an additional event here. So that when we teleport into here, we activate that um, uh, that we activate the occlusion. Um, I wonder. Well, yeah. Okay. Where are we? So the the script is on barbellith. So if I grab barbellith and then barbellith occlusion. And ah, this is not doing what I was expecting. Okay, I'm gonna need to create a function for this for this to work. So I'm gonna need to create a function that lets us set occlusion active. Um so that should be straightforward. Okay, and if we come back to Unity, we should now be able to access that function here. Yes, there we go. Um, oh, wait, hang on a sec. 
should probably use C sharp's preferred naming conventions. Okay, try again. Uh, where are we? Set. Hang on, I suppose it's a typo. Try again. Right, set the collision active and then we have that toggled on. And then when we exit this, when we exit void 2, which again will be happening, that happens, I guess. Nope. Uh, is it this one? Uh, no, it'll be in door, won't it? Teleport trigger volume. Yeah, so we add another event um, where this time we just turn off the occlusion once we uh, once we exit. Oh, and that just seems to automatically. Okay, well anyway, uh, so that that should work the way I want it to. <clears throat> um, so let's give it a shot. Uh, I think I'll have to run through the whole game just to check that it's working the way I want. So the first place we should be able to test it is here, because before it was getting triggered by the... The door here is currently there, but it's invisible, and before we were getting the... The occlusion was kind of, um... Was getting hit by the door. But, at the moment, to be honest, the barbell is so quiet that I can't actually tell. Um, we did hear that weird kind of, uh... That, that buffer stutter when the door, when I, th I think that happened when the door uh, came into existence, which is strange. I wonder why that is. And we heard it again there. It might be something to do with uh, interlude one. So here we want to, we should be able to hear the occlusion in here. Petals all fall on the creature and the fur so Yep. Okay, cool. So the occlusion's working here. And then the next thing we need to check is we need to check if it's if it's definitely getting deactivated for the final Taking scene. The dog with us. The scarlet flowers. Birds. So before the the path was, it actually sounds very quiet. Oh, okay. So I think I know why it sounds so quiet. Um. Okay. So uh, I'll just explain why I think it's quiet. Um. So if we look at my code, um, I'm using this uh, occlusion active flag to basically activate and deactivate all of this code here, which is the stuff that's actually sending the occlusion uh, signal into my PD patch uh, here. Um, and of course the problem there is if we deactivate all this code, so if we stop running this code while uh, Barbalith is occluded, then the last value that we, the last occlusion value that we sent to Barbalith will be like one or something close to one. So what I need to do here is if occlusion, uh, in fact, if not occlusion active. So what I'm going to do is if we are deactivating the occlusion, then I need to, 
I need to send an updated uh, occlusion value of zero. Oh, I hate that. Anyway, sorry. Uh, so I need to res I need to send another occlusion value, but set it to zero so that um, uh, any future instances of Barbalis uh, are not acting as though they're getting occluded, basically. So now, let's see. Now when we get to that final scene, we should hear Barbalis at full volume. I think I can just skip through to here. Double check that the occlusion is definitely working. Yep, okay, so the, the occlusion's working. Quickly run through. In fact, oh, I, uh, I would I would skip to the last scene, but I forget what number key it is. I don't want to break things. Okay, that sounds better. We can hear it pretty loud already. And if we hide it by the behind the, the path, we're not hearing it. It's an obviously a uh, It was more noticeable right at the top. So I'll just run it to the top. Here, Barbara saw it entirely included visually, but we're not hearing it. Uh, we don't hear it get, getting sonically occluded, which is what we wanted. Okay, so that was that was the first thing I wanted to do this week. Um, so now the occlusion only happens in the the church section. Uh, now the next thing I want to do is I want to come to my Barbalith patch, and I want to get rid of that uh, that glitchy. Kind of rhythmic effect because I don't think that works very well. Um, so I think I'm just going to delete all of these, delete all of these objects, and let's see. Um, uh, in fact, let me let's just listen to to this. Um, this won't be too loud. It's quite loud. I think there's something strange going on with the size. Um, I'm just going to close this patch and reopen it because I don't. I think there's something strange where it's getting initialized to a different value than. What size is doing? Yeah, that's what I would expect it to sound like to begin with. Um, maybe. Well, I don't. Uh, that's fine. And then. Yeah. Okay. So this sounds more like what I would expect it to sound like. We start with a kind of uh, buzzy drone, and then as the size increases, it increases to a a large, kind of denser drone, basically, which is kind of what we want. So anyway, uh, what I want to do is we've got these kind of we've got these four uh, kind of nodes. Uh, 
are kind of visualized in blue here uh, around the spiral. And each of these nodes effectively, it corresponds to some parameter in, in this patch. And I've, kind of got, I've got sliders here. So the first one is a kind of high pitched sign. That's uh, this section here. And the, the sign is kind of driven by the noise that drives a whole bunch of other stuff. Then the second one is uh, controlling a tuned comb filter, which we have here. Um, yep, basically just a, a single comb filter that's tuned to a specific frequency. Um, and, oh, in fact, it's, it's tuned to the same frequency as our as our drone's frequency. So it should be kind of resonating with the, the drone itself. And then our third slider is a peaking filter. So basically just a resonant, a resonant filter. Um, so our last one, um, what I'm kind of thinking is I'm wondering if we can make use of uh, PD's built-in uh, reverb models. Um, so I have an idea for what I want to do here. Um, I'm just going to call this reverb. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a, a big reverb with, uh, with like a long decay. <laughs> and I'm going to I'm going to amplify it and feed it into distortion um, so we get something kind of gnarly and and yeah and hopefully that will kind of fit with the overall um, kind of droniness of the sound uh, we'll see um, so I think it's uh, is it rev 3 that I want yeah and let's see so Parameters are level, uh, liveness, crossover frequency, and high frequency damping. Um, level. Well, let's start. Let's just start with the uh, suggested values from the from the help file. Um, oops. And oh, uh, in fact, we're going to need. I want to do it quite like this because what we're going to need is we need to kind of crossfade between the the reverb signal and the original signal. Um, oh. um, I kind of wish. PD had a built-in kind of crossfade uh, object uh, for this kind of thing. Um, right, so we're going to be receiving. Uh, oh, I forgot the name of it. Um, we're going to be receiving node four. Uh, here we go. So we will do. So we'll just invert this uh, so that when node 4 is 1, when it's at its maximum, we won't hear the input signal at all. Um, uh, yeah, in fact, we can probably just quickly test that out, can't we? Oops. OK, and where's? Got too many windows open. Um, okay, uh, that's not what I was. There we go. Yes, okay. So when our slider's all the way down, we're hearing only the original signal. And when we turn it all the way up, we hear nothing at the moment because we're not actually hooked in, hooked our reverb up. So, next step. Uh, we need uh, something similar. We need another couple of multiplication objects. And to kind of minimize the number of wires we have crossing over, I'm just going to add another one of these receive node fours. 
And this one, we don't need to, we don't need to invert it like we did here because what we want is we want the reverb to be, we want to hear the reverb when node four is one uh, and not hear it when it's, uh, when it's zero. So, okay, so on its own, that doesn't sound super interesting. So the next step, um, make this window a bit bigger. For the next step, I'm going to get rid of these wires. I'm going to amplify my reverb. And then we're going to stick it into another one of these tanth functions. Um, I'm sure I've explained this in a previous uh, stream, but the tanth is a, a function that uh, it's really nice if you want a kind of soft clipping distortion. It's just a super simple way of creating a distortion that clips the signal, um, but doesn't do it in a kind of super harsh kind of digital fashion. It does it in a kind of smoother, more kind of analog uh, fashion. Um, and in fact, I think I want to make this quieter because it's probably going to be quite loud if we're amplifying it and then distorting it. So let's try that. Kind of just sounds like we're just distorting the signal. I was hoping we'd hear a bit more of the reverb in there. Let's see. Uh, oh, is there anything I can do to make it sound to make the reverb more reverby? Um, well, I guess we can turn up the liveness. Maybe turn down the high frequency damping. Um, well, uh, let me stick in some. So I think I only, I think I only care about the liveness and the damping. So if I set these to their current values, and then we can play with that and figure out. This is exactly doing what I what I want it to do. Um, let's add a let's add, add in a third uh, number number box and see what happens. So, so this is the the crossover frequency. So basically, the way this reverb works is um, every if you've got this last value greater than zero, then every all of the frequencies in the reverb above this frequency here, so 3000. All the frequency above that will get uh, uh, effectively damped by a certain amount defined by this slider. So if this is up to up at like 100, then the frequencies beyond 3, three kilohertz are going to be getting like fully damped. Um, so I guess what I'm wondering is if we turn this, if we turn the crossover frequency down and turn the high frequency damping up, does that mean we're going to get a kind of super kind of low frequency kind of distorted reverb out of this. Um, let's, let's see. <laughs> I guess the answer to that question is no. That did not seem to make much difference to the sound at all. Hmm. 
Hmm. Yeah. I wonder what we can do. Um, this is not... Hmm. Uh, well, let's just let's just add one more uh, number box so we can set the, the volume. So this is the 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 normal volume. This is the reverb at, at its loudest. Um, and if we turn this down, it effectively turns down the level as well. Although I guess this is meant to be the kind of size of the reverb, so larger sizes mean it's kind of simulating a larger room. This cross of... oh actually hang on, let's turn up. Crossover doesn't seem to have much doesn't seem to make much of a difference to the sound, and I think probably I think probably the reason it's not making much difference to the sound is that we've got a drone, so we're probably not giving the reverb enough. We're not giving it the right kind of signal to hear a kind of nice um, what do you call it? Uh, a kind of nice reverb tail because the sound is kind of constant. Um, uh, so yeah, this reverb isn't really doing what I was hoping it would do. Hmm. I think it's also a wee bit loud, so I'm going to turn it down a bit more here. I'm going to set it, set it back to 120. Oh. Um, which sounds like this. Yeah, I don't know that that's super exciting. It just it really it just sounds like we're just kind of distorting the the original drone, which isn't mm, not particularly exciting. Um, I'm wondering what I could do differently, um, or what I could do instead as a as a different effect. Um, hmm. Okay, well, I'm gonna start by just. Disconnecting this reverb sub patch I've created. And also, I'm not sure what this is. Um, might just delete that. Doesn't look like it's important. Doesn't look. It's not really connected to anything. So get rid of that. Um, I wonder what our drone would sound like if we fed it through a chorus effect. Let's try that. Um, and let's see if I can. Uh, let's see how well I can code a, a chorus effect in PD. So we are going to need a delay. Um, and I might just add some kind of add some dollar symbol stuff just because we're probably going to need two of these because we've got a stereo signal. Um, so we're going to write that into our delay, and we'll need the same thing again. We'll need to we'll need to amplify, or we're going to need to attenuate the our input signal. No, wait, sorry, we don't need to do that. If it's chorus, we add a, to create a chorus effect. You add a, a the input signal to a delayed copy of the signal with a continually varying delay time. So first thing we need to do, oh, I need to set the size of this delay line, don't I? Um, it doesn't need to be super big. Uh, well, I'll set it to a second, just, which is probably going to be significantly longer than we need it to be, but that's fine.
Um, okay, now I need to remind myself how. Is that right? Okay. Uh, Okay, okay. So uh, we're going to basically add. Oh, this one we can amplify by that uh, that node for receive. So when node four is one, we'll he we should hear the, the chorus fit. Uh, now the next thing I need to do is I need to have the the delay time of my chorus. Uh, varying, and I'm just going to use a, a sine wave oscillator for this. I think uh, let's let's set it to, to five hertz. And uh, now I'm going to need to do some maths because I will want. Uh, actually, let me just check how this works. Uh, yeah, delay time. Um, so uh, if I remember correctly. Uh, Chorus delay times are around about 10 milliseconds. Um, so if we... So 10 milliseconds, uh, if we're assuming a 44.1 kilohertz. Oh no, wait. Delray, Delray takes milliseconds, so let's just set 10... Um, wait, hang on. Let's do this differently. Uh, we're going to we're going to start by modifying the the range of our oscillator. So normally an oscillator goes from minus one to plus one. Um, if we're we're going to want to oscillate around about the ten milliseconds mark. So let's say we go from eight milliseconds to twelve milliseconds. So I can multiply my oscillator by two. That's going to go from minus two to plus two. And then if we just add on 10, uh, it'll now go from 8 milliseconds to 12 milliseconds. Um, okay. Oh. And I'm just going to feed one input through this, just while I'm testing it. Okay, that's kind of interesting. It's not quite what I was expecting. It's not quite as uh, noticeable as I was expecting it to be. Um, actually, it's, it kind of sounds like it's doing it already. Uh, well, it is doing a chorus effect. It's just um, it's maybe not as noticeable as I would like. I think it's also the frequencies maybe a bit. Uh, the frequency of our uh, oscillators maybe a bit much. Um, uh, if I reduce this to two. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to add in a, a number box here because I want to see what happens when we vary the delay time. I'm wondering if I could turn it into a flanger because a flanger is really just it's basically the same setup as a as a chorus. It's just you use different delay times, and I forget which delay times. I forget what a flanger 
what the typical flanger delay time is versus a chorus delay time. <laughs> Okay, this is maybe working, it's maybe getting closer to, I think if we turn it into a flanger, maybe that that will be more effective. Um, which I think means we need shorter delay times. Oh, also, uh, let's see. The, these numbers are probably wrong now. What's that sound like? <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. I... Okay, so I think I'm going to... I'm going to have a go at uh, adding a bit of feedback into this. Um, so we're going to take the output of our flanger and feed it back into the input. Into the, so we're kind of delaying the signal by a certain amount, and then feeding the delayed copy back into the signal, and that should have the effect of effectively amplifying or like magnifying the the, the flanger effect. Hopefully, um, we'll see. This is very much me just kind of experimenting, trying to get something that I think sounds good. <laughs> Okay, that maybe that maybe works. Um, so I think I'm probably happy with those numbers. Um, delete that. I do kind of I want I think I want to see the output of all of this because um, it's sounding a bit like it might be. Uh, what I, let me. I'm gonna have to remind myself how you you visualize the output of uh, of audio in PD. Um, uh, it's kind of sounding to me like it, it there might be a bit of DC in there, but I'm not sure. Uh, so I need to actually have a look. Is this how Tabrite works? Um, Yes, it does. So if we 
add a metro. Um, so I said array was 2024. Uh, oh, can't, I can't do maths. What is uh, okay? Let's let's get metro triggering every. Well, let's just do it every 250 milliseconds. So we're going to be writing into our array every 250 milliseconds. Um, and we're going to be writing the, the output of this tant distortion in there. Okay. So I think what's happening, the reason everything sounds kind of weird is that we're we're very, very loud. And the only thing that's keeping us from like digitally clipping are the are these uh tanth functions at the end, uh which are effectively giving it that uh that nice kind of smooth clipping shape. Pause it. Kind of there, you kind of you can just about see like this isn't quite a pure sine wave. It's starting to get kind of squashed at the tops and bottoms. You can see in places that, but yeah, like here it becomes a lot more like a a, a curvy square wave. Um, so that that's an indication that our tan function is working and it's clipping our signal. But it's also an indication that we're probably too loud. Um, uh, and it's kind of massacring a lot of the other uh, components of the signal. Um, I'm gonna be honest; I'm not entirely sure how we how we fix that. Uh, but um, turn this off. I'm gonna I'm gonna hold on to you because uh, it's I find it useful to be able to visualize the signal. Um, I'm gonna make a copy of my chorus patch because again, we're working. In, we've got a stereo system here. Uh, I'm, just, I'm going to name these course 1 and course 2 because I'm going to change the settings. Wait, hang on, did I miss a thing? I did. That should be point 0.1, shouldn't it? I'm going to change the settings of our two choruses so we get so they're slightly different. Um, so instead of point 0.1, this will be point 0.15. Um, yeah, and maybe no, no, that's fine. We'll leave it to that. And now, if I turn this back on, um, here we go. So you can kind of hear it from time to time. It feels like the sound is getting kind of squeezed. And if you look at the the array down here, every time we hear it getting squeezed, it's getting squeezed because it's so loud that the the tanth, the soft clipper is basically squashing the majority of the signal and basically clipping it at the top and bottom of the range. Um, so we're gonna have to figure out what's going on in order to fix that at some point. Um, but for the time being, I think this is probably good enough. Uh, I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to save this and we're going to listen to it in the game. Because uh, I think we've got something that potentially works a bit better than what we had before. There was that kind of glitchy effect. I'm hoping uh, flanger is a bit more of an interesting effect for that last bit. Here we go.
Okay. Okay. So something that is now confusing me is Barbalith doesn't sound as loud in the game as it does in PD. So what is happening there? Um, okay, I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to add a print statement. Because um, I think the only thing that could make it sound different is this size variable, and I can't think why. Uh, I think I left this comment here because this is what I'm expecting size to be. I'm expecting it to go between 1 and 20. But it seems like maybe it's not doing that. So let's let's print out size and see what it's actually, what size is actually set to in the game. Size is set to four. Going up to 20. But we're not hearing it do that same kind of squeezing effect. Like when we when we listen to the, the flanger in PD, like at at certain parts of like the Flanders range, we kind of hear it kind of disappear as the whole thing kind of just gets crunched. But we're not hearing that when it's running in Unity. Even though we're sending it the same, we're sending it the same size variable, right? Yeah, it's going from one to twenty. Um. Does that kind of squ squeezing, kind of crunching sound uh, at the ends of its range? So, why is that happening? Um, first of all, we're not changing the volume in Unity. Volume set at one, so it can't be that. Um, I mean, unless well, let's let's keep an eye on the the attenuation curve here and see where we are when we're listening to it, because it might be that it's getting it it's getting attenuated via this. Well, I think we should. If that were the case, we should still hear the crunching because the crunching happens when it goes through the. Oh, I can hear myself talking. Interesting. So, no. So here, I mean, we're basically oh, maybe that's it. Maybe it, we only hear it fully if we're right in the middle. That might be what it is. Ah, that is what that is what's happening. So our listener was kind of about here. It's kind of sitting at about this range when we're on the path, and because we've got this curve that kind of that actually drops off quite significantly, uh, quite close to Barbalith, I think that's what's happening. Um, and now that I've said that, I'm kind of remembering that I did actually I played with the the distance stuff in order to fix the the crunch the kind of squeeze and crunching effect that we were hearing in game. Um okay and that that will be why or will it? Well okay hang on let's let's watch this again um in the first section. Cause I'm wondering if this is why Barbalith is so quiet to begin with, because we're are we are we maybe doing something with our our max distance in order to uh, deal with the fact that it was way too loud in that final scene. And 
Okay, so we can see the, the listener appear in the graph. Well, actually, we get pretty close. We do get pretty close. I feel like it should be louder than it is, uh, but if we're that close to it. Ah, so the reason it's so quiet here is because we're kind of... Um, our, can I get my mouse cursor? Our, our listener is kind of hard to see in Unity's dark skin, but our listener is here. So it's, it's super quiet. Okay. Uh, well, I think we're, we're coming to the end of my hour. Um, so I'm going to have to leave that for next week. Um, uh, let's see, so my... Uh, here's my to-do list. Let me just, but I'll make it bigger and change the format so if you're watching you can see what I'm doing. There we go. Uh, so, um, uh, we changed node 4 so we're just going to ignore that one. Uh, we'll leave, we might come back to node 4, the, the flanger effect later, but I think the main thing is uh, fix barbalith volume issues. Um, we're, so we're modifying, what is it? I think we're modifying, we're doing something with max distance, I think. I think, I, I seem to remember I do have a script somewhere that's doing, that's dealing with max distance. So that's probably what I need to do. That's probably the main thing I, I need to do to get Barbalist kind of staying at a consistent level. Um, I don't know, I think Part of the problem is just that this patch has gotten so big and there are parts of it that I've made and parts of it that, Jan, that Jan's made. I don't think either of us are quite uh, confident about uh, modifying the others, um, the others' parts. Um, I don't really know what's going on in here. Um, anyway, I think I'm going to stop there. So uh, let's just do one more uh, walk up the, up the spiral tower. Um, and then I'll stop for today. I'm going to stop there. So uh, let me switch uh, back. So uh, well, thank you for watching. Um, all of this will go up on GitHub uh, soon. Uh, there is the link. And yeah, I think we're almost there. Uh, I think we're almost finished. So maybe one or two more streams uh, and then we'll be done. Um, but OK, I'm going to stop there. I'll leave you, uh, I'll let you get on with other, other things. <laughs>